Okay. Well, good morning, everybody. I'm happy to be back here at the ET Exchange again this year talking to you about cybersecurity. I hear you're a millennial friendly bunch, so that's fantastic for myself. Um, so hopefully this goes well for everybody. Um, so my, <laughs> my uh, talk today is about how we can enable the attackers through digital transformation, how we can help them out. Uh, so obviously that's not our goal, uh, but unfortunately when we go through digital transformation we do create a lot of vulnerabilities that are easy for attackers to exploit. So we're going to talk today about ways that we can maybe make sure that we're digitally transforming in a more secure manner. So DX is something we've been talking about for a long time, I won't get into it, uh, I'm sure it's been a topic for the last couple of days, but the idea is, is that we are using technology to change how we operate and how we grow our business. And so we can see our technologies there on the right hand side. From a security standpoint, all these, all these technologies are doing is increasing the size of our attack surface. So whether you're using IoT and having problems with old firmware, if you're on social media, they use that as a social engineering attack to do spear phishing and things like that. Every technology that we adopt is another vulnerability uh, that can be exploited. So this is a familiar slide. Joe just went over this one. Um, but we have two different points here. So we have this group that's digitally distraught and we have the other group that is doing things uh, very well and we call them digitally determined. So the determined group, that 35%, they have a singular cohesive digital roadmap and strategy. And by having that, what they're doing is, is they're making sure that the lines of business, the various different departments, they're using these technologies, they're adopting things like cloud and AI and what have you, but they're doing so with supervision from the AI, sorry, from the cybersecurity and the IT department. So with that singular view, they have a, a good structure and a good roadmap going forward. Now, digitally distraught is interesting. There's some great innovation going on with different departments. Maybe marketing is using AI, or you have uh, HR using some cloud applications, things like that. But the problem is, is without that singular roadmap, it's the Wild West. People are adopting technologies um, without necessarily having the skill sets to support them. So the cloud, cloud applications are extremely powerful. The compute resources we have that are out there are, are fantastic, but it also introduces a lot of risk if we don't use them correctly. And so when we talk about this digitally distraught group, this is a great survey question we run that sort of outlines this disjoint view of the organization between the two. So we have our IT department on the left here and we ask them, you know, what are your top cybersecurity concerns and what are the roadblocks that you run into when you try to improve security at your organization? And we can ask the line of business the same question. So it's interesting here, the IT department blames the staff they're doing things they shouldn't, they're opening emails, they're clicking, they're not doing the training, stuff like that, which makes sense. And of course, if we go on the flip side, the line of business is blaming the IT department saying, well, you don't have the skills. You don't really know how to protect us. And I think what really drives the point home here is that the line of business thinks that security is a technology problem. Whereas if we ask the IT department, they believe it's a people and process conversation. So we have this disjoint view. And this slide's a little busy, I apologize, but what we're showing here is just how integrated cybersecurity is with our various lines of business. Now, I picked out three or four here, including the C-suite, uh, to give you an example, but there's similar results across the board. And if you look at the sort of the dark orange um, column there, sorry, the, the, the piece of the, of the row, what we're showing is these are the uh, organizations that only talk to the cybersecurity department after an incident has occurred. So they're calling them up when they've had a breach or they've had an infiltration, it's far too late. In fact, 37% of organizations, uh, the C-suite only talks to the cybersecurity team after a breach has occurred. Not doing it annually or you know, uh, on a quarterly basis, it's far too long. And if you think about HR and all the PII that they have access to and all the customer records and uh, internal records, they should be having this conversation more often. So we have a big problem with siloing within our own organizations. And when we start digitally transforming and that digitally distraught group starts adopting technologies, the IT team may be aware of it, but they're not aware of how they're using it or what data they're putting into these new systems. And the cybersecurity team probably isn't aware of it either. 
And so we only have a few minutes, uh, so I'm going to jump around a little bit. I wanted to talk about identity and digital trust or identity and access management, however you want to position it. This is a market where we've done, uh, we've done some really great things, but we have a long way to go. So if you think about identity and access management, five or six years ago, I would assume the majority of us in here weren't using uh, multi-factor authentication or single sign-on. Now, you know, it's pretty prevalent in the majority of organizations. Cloud adoptions help that. But we've done a very good job of securing the end users. Now, where we're still struggling a little bit, despite uh, um, you know, it being a, an issue for, for decades, is the, is the back end, the internal systems. So our IT admins and our actual IT folks who are working on our internal systems. And that's that privileged access management. So that back end, and when we talk about digital transformation, I'll tie this back in in a few slides, but the idea is, is that um, if, if our IT admins aren't doing a good job, then we have a lot of issues with respect to cybersecurity as well. So I have a couple examples here. You may think my IT folk are great. They, you know, they practice what they preach, but that's not necessarily the case. And I don't know if anyone recognizes this gentleman here. So he is from um, a broadcaster called TV Sync in France. They have multiple channels across Europe, a uh, fairly big broadcaster. Unfortunately, maybe three or four years ago, they were a victim of a cybersecurity breach. And this was a large breach. It knocked out their entire network, uh, a lot of upset customers. So this gentleman invited a TV crew into his office, uh, into his station, rather. And he set up a live broadcast and apologized to them for this data breach. So while he's on TV doing this live uh, broadcast, he's actually conducting his own data breach, because over his right shoulder are all his uh, privileged account passwords on that piece of paper on the wall. right? And so this is a large broadcast. This would be an enterprise-sized organization that's, that's doing this. And you may think, well, that's a one-off. You know, this doesn't happen very often. No, there's lots of examples on the internet. This again, this gentleman here, he works for the Hawaii Emergency Response Center. So their job is to make sure that if there's a, a tsunami or, or a hurricane or what have you, that they alert everyone. They just had a little problem with telling everyone a missile was coming, if you remember that. Um, so the Associated Press did an article on these guys, and uh, it was interesting, and they took a few snapshots for the, for the article. Uh, and so this gentleman here, he's smiling for the camera, and he's got sticky notes with all his passwords all over his, uh, his laptop there. So it, it is a problem, and tying it back to digital transformation, we need to practice the idea of least privilege. So removing excessive privilege, whether it's on the back end with our IT admins or our end users, you know, should an IT admin have access to the cloud, to our uh, security appliances, to our switches, to our servers? You know, when was the last time that those passwords were changed? Are they sharing credentials? These are all issues that as our attack surface grows, they become more and more of an issue as well. Automation, uh, Joe talked about it a little bit as well, the idea that we can automate some of these uh, cloud workloads so when we provision some resources, they're automatically shut down and secure. And that gets into cloud, which is sort of the next area I want to jump to quickly. So when we think about digital transformation, we've been using cloud for, what, 15 years now. It's probably one of the uh, DX third platform technologies that we talk about that we're most comfortable with. So in terms of adoption, we have uh, SaaS adoption in Canada over 90%, uh, IaaS adoption over 75 But the issue is, is that we're not securing these platforms. We're adopting them, we're great at that, but then we don't follow up. So we see here that 37% of organizations don't understand shared responsibility with their provider. Now, how can you deploy security controls if you don't know what you're responsible for or your provider is? Am I doing encryption? Am I doing log management? Who's taking care of virtual firewalls? We don't know. And the reason why is because less than one third of organizations have created cybersecurity policies for the cloud. That's a staggering number. That's very scary. Um, we have plans maybe for our endpoints, and we have um, um, policies for uh, our on-premise networks, but we haven't done that in the cloud despite that strong adoption. <clears throat> and this is why it's scary. So there's a gentleman, uh, his name is Adrian Grigoroff. Um, he presented at TASC, Toronto Area Security Clutch in Toronto, uh, back in the summer. He's a, he's a really great guy. He runs a company called Manage Sentinel. But he creates this list. And what we have here are security controls that we would deploy on-premise, on the left. And we have the uh, comparable controls that you'd find in these cloud environments, so AWS, Azure, what have you. And this list is so long, I couldn't fit it on a slide. It'd probably take almost three slides to fit it all. 
And you can see here, someone like Azure has their own proprietary security controls across the stack. AWS has some that they can offer. Maybe you need to have a firewall vendor to fill in a few things for virtual appliances, things like that. But the idea is, if you're using one of these platforms, it's incredibly complex. If you're using multi-cloud, can you tell me that you have someone on your staff who understands multiple cloud environments to the level where they know which of these controls need to be deployed and how to deploy them correctly and configure them correctly? Probably not. Outside of the largest enterprise organizations, we probably aren't hitting all the buckets that we should be. And this is what happens when you have the wrong people using this very powerful technology. So this is an example here of uh, there is an uh, individual who worked for the Indian government. He managed to spin up an instance of MongoDB that was old and out of date. They didn't have any default identity and access management controls, so no access controls. It was open to the public. He managed to put 275 million citizens' records up into an AWS instance with no security controls. And you can see the type of information on the left here that he had, basically everything you'd ever need to do identity theft down to job preferences, things like that. Now, if you think 10, 15 years ago, if you tried to spin up on your on-premise environment a database with 275 million records, you'd probably need new servers, you'd need to involve IT. Now, though, and this may be uh, too big of an example, but the idea is, is that with a credit card, people on your staff uh, can, can do this type of thing quite easily and without necessarily the help from IT. So that's where we get into this problem where we're digitally transforming, but we're not integrated and we don't have the help of the IT or the security team, and this is the problem we can have. Of course, here, this isn't a, this isn't a happy ending. The uh, database was stolen and held for ransom. Um, a security researcher saw it. They got to the Indian CERT team but they got there too late, the data was stolen, and, and you know, that's the end of the story. There's an interesting quote, though, from this uh, Danny Bradbury from Sophos, and I won't read it out, but the idea is it's extremely frustrating that there are, you know, a, a single individual can um, endanger the lives or you know, have detrimental effects on the lives of millions of people just by simply doing and using technology they don't understand. And that is the, uh, the pitfall of, of DX. And so we just went through cloud, something that we know very well, we've been using for years, but think about that broader DX conversation. Uh, again, sorry, it's a bit of a busy graph, but the idea here, everything that's left of that dark orange is technologies that we are using today. Maybe we're not using them across the organization, maybe they're just pilot projects, but each one of these technologies is gonna have security concerns, just like we talked about with cloud. So we need to be very aware of that uh, when we start going into, you know, even virtual reality or IoT or DevOps or what have you. And to sort of build on that idea, we asked Canadian organizations, you know, are you using machine learning and AI? And 35% said, yeah, we have a deployment today. Again, may not be across the entire organization, but we have a line of business or a department playing with this today. So the number one use is by the IT security team, which is fantastic. You know, using machine learning, you can find patterns on malicious behavior for internal threats, or you can look at the network itself and look for malicious traffic, things like that. The applications are sound. The number two user is sales and marketing. Now, an AI or a machine learning algorithm needs uh, copious amounts of data you to feed to it so that it can make any sorts of heads or tails out of it. So what are they feeding it? Well, it's customer data. Now, are they scraping this for PII? Are they moving it into the cloud? Are they violating um, SLAs with their customers? I don't know. I'm not going to guess that most of these, they may, have a, um, they may have a data scientist. I don't know. But do they have a cybersecurity professional on that team? Who's involved in that AI project with a marketing or sales team? And it's a great question to ask because you could be violating PIPIDA or GDPR or what have you, depending on how you're using that customer data. So we've shown that um, you know, DX is a powerful, uh, game-changing tool, but it's also, uh, there's some security risks associated with that. Now, if you think that your organization is struggling or has some issues to work out, think about your partners. So on average here, we see that small organizations in Canada have about four partners. As we get to the mid-market, we're already up to 17, 18 partners. And finally, large organizations are partnered with 25 uh, different organizations, and that, that seems low to me. I was talking to a grocer in Ontario 
third-party partner security was his biggest concern. He had hundreds of partners between the um, you know, warehouse and um, um, wholesale transportation, his different, you know, Kellogg's Post, you name it, they're all in his store. So he's very concerned about that. The problem is though, and I don't have the answer for it today, hopefully we can get better at this, but the idea is that we can't do a formal threat risk assessment on every one of our partners. Resources are finite, it's just not, it's not possible. So we see on average we're doing a somewhat formal threat risk assessment on about 46% of our partners today, so fairly low. What we do with the rest of our partners is we kind of, we treat it like buying a used car, you know, we kind of kick the tires, we look around, we ask a few questions and we hope for the best. So when we're doing this sort of initial threat risk assessment on our partners, we're asking about two things that throw up a red flag is, are they storing my data or do they have access to my network? Number three is, if they've had a cybersecurity breach in the last year or so, I'm probably quite concerned about this partner, maybe I should go further with them and, and do a formal assessment. Now it's interesting, I would argue that if they had a breach recently, they're probably one of the most secure organizations out there because of all the fallout and flack they get from that, uh, but you, you can see their position as well. What's very interesting is number four, getting back to cloud. We're actually very concerned about partners who are cloud first. Are they doing IaaS, PaaS, and SaaS correctly? Are they doing this proper controls and do they know about shared responsibility? It's actually a top concern for us. And then as we go down the list, you can see here we have uh, large partners we're more concerned about uh, than small. Again, you could argue large partners have um, a larger attack surface, but they probably have better controls, whereas a small partner is more, um, you know, has, has less of a, a footprint and harder to find, but their controls are probably worse. So it's interesting to see, you know, how they position those two against each other. <clears throat> so if we do that, that a 46% that does a formal risk assessment on their partners, well, what does that actually mean? To me, it would mean, you know, getting a consulting firm to come in and, and, and do a proper assessment, but that's not exactly what they're doing. They're building in some um, clauses in their contracts. Uh, so if something bad does happen, if a breach occurs, they can sue or what have you. So it's a reactive versus a proactive strategy. They're looking for evidence of uh, credentials. So you have a CISSP, you have CompTIA, Security Plus, those types of uh, accreditations on your, on your employees, and they're looking for certification. So, uh, you know, are you, are you PCI compliant, things like that. What's interesting, though, as we go further down the list, something like having the partner complete a questionnaire, which seems pretty simple to me, and a great way to sort of assess your partners, the adoption is actually quite low. Um, if you think about if you have dozens of partners, what's scalable, what can you automate, um, and what can you update regularly, it's a survey. You can survey your partners on a quarterly basis if you'd like, and if there's any issues, you can throw a red flag and, and deal with it from there. But unfortunately, we're not even doing those basics when it comes to third-party partner security. And so to follow up here, in general, Canadian organizations believe that they're doing a better job securing their organization than their partners are. And if that's true, we need to focus more on third-party uh, security than we are. And this stat here, I think this was very surprising to me. 14% of Canadian organizations indicated that they have experienced a security breach in the last year because of the poor sec security hygiene of their partners. 14% is, is extremely high. I'd argue that's, that'd be getting in the range of phishing attacks and, and breaches caused by uh, your internal employees and things like that. So it's a real problem today that we need to address. So I uh, will finish up here. I'm not going to go through, through all of these takeaways, but uh, we didn't talk about cybersecurity frameworks today, but um, you know something like the NIST CSF or ISO 27000, what they help you do is identify those assets on your network. So if you do have that instance of MongoDB out there, it helps you find that. It helps you um, <clears throat> try to um, quantify how much of the different data types you have out there. So do you have PII in the cloud? Is it on-premise? And that helps you use your security budget wisely. If you don't know where your crown jewels are, you don't know where your data is, it's really hard to spend your budget in the right spots. We talked about evolving that identity management strategy and revisiting some of the basics around privileged access management, improving communications between your um, lines of business and the cybersecurity department is, is very important. If you're on the cybersecurity team and you're not getting face time with the, with the board, it's very hard to get the resources or the budget you're looking for to improve your cybersecurity posture. Uh, we talked about third-party ecosystems and then number five, 
I think what's very important is that security services uh, is an ever-evolving market and it's becoming more attractive to organizations all the time. We actually have been tracking um, why organizations go to manage security services. And price used to be at the very bottom and every year it works its way up. As our attack surface grows, it gets very hard to do that in-house at an efficient cost, right? So if you're in the cloud, if you're using mobile, if you're using social media, if you're across all these new technologies going into IoT, doing that and finding those professionals who can cover that in-house gets more difficult every year. So consider cons security services if you haven't yet. And so that's it for me. Uh, I think we've got some time for questions, so uh, please feel free to ask. Otherwise, I'll be around afterwards. Um, and thanks for having me. This has been, this has been great. I'm curious to know, um, I was having a conversation with a couple of the guys last night. I really believe CIO jobs are, you know, on many levels, no, no offense, Joe, wherever you are, worst jobs in the world. Because <laughs> on the one hand, we got to be thinking all of this out there and, you know, the next horizon and the horizon after that, and we have to be able to articulate all of those things. We have to do it effectively and deliver. But then you get into this stuff, which we, we also have to be beyond reproach on. Mm -hmm. um, and having spent a lot of time in the last 10 years swirling around in small companies and, and talking to CIOs in other small companies, it amazes me the extent to which people I know have had breach situations. They get in front of the executives and the executives always go to, and it was kind of there in some of the data you had, they always go to, well, what do you mean we don't do that? You know, how did that happen? Mm -hmm. and, and, and things like, you know, you mean we don't know all the time what everybody's doing? Uh, no. We can go back and look, maybe, mm -hmm. and find out. And, and there's just this fundamental gap between the reality of what, even if we're investing 30% of our budget in security, what we can actually be doing on a progressive level, and what the business, because they've read all these magazines on airplanes, think we're doing. Mm -hmm. is, is there data out there that, that actually, you know, as a, as a context setting thing that actually says, in reality, in Canada or in North America, these, these are the number of companies that have had inside employee breaches. These are the number of companies that have had actual PII data. Or, or, or is, there, is there data that actually says this is where companies are at in terms of privileged access management or SIEM for internal activity. Like, are there benchmarks or data that can help mm -hmm. the mid-market CIOs at least backstop themselves on this stuff? Sure, yeah. Um, so for Canadian-specific data, there is a study um, that uh, we conduct with Scalar on a yearly basis. And for this, it's the Scalar Security Study. Um, last year, we, we did something very interesting. We, instead of just saying, you know, this many Canadians have breaches, we, what we did is we did a cluster analysis, and we tried to figure out, you know, what separates an organization that, that has a, very few breaches versus one that, that has a lot. And so we looked at it a few different ways. So how are they identifying uh, their assets and their resources in the network? Are they training? Are they patching? Do they have an incident response plan? And do they have a recovery plan? And they don't have to be huge formal documents as long as there's something there. And what we found is, is that we're, just by having all those pieces, and you don't have to have a formalized training you know, on a monthly basis or anything like that, as long as you're doing something in all those areas, the number of breaches were reduced by half. Um, so that's a free study that you can download from the Scalar site. There's all sorts of great insight there. Um, so I'd, I'd reference that. Um, I'm not sure in terms of Canadian-specific research what else is available locally. Um, I know uh, Deloitte has a few studies. Um, someone like TELUS used to do the TELUS Rotman study, but they don't do that anymore. I don't know how many are left, but that's a great starting point. Any other questions for Kevin? Kevin, thank you very right. much. Thank you. Appreciate your insights. And <clears throat>